Okay, it didn't jump me this time. So we are in the book of Romans today. Um, Romans chapter one is where we start. So to give you guys a background to Romans, um, Paul had, when he wrote this letter, he wrote it um, when he had been in Corinth for three months back in Acts chapter 20. So just having recently come through the book of Acts, um, you know, everything is fresh in our memory, which is good. So when Paul was doing his missionary work, all of his epistles, which, okay, just so that you guys know, out of the 21 epistles that are in the New Testament, Paul wrote 13 of them. And some of them are prison epistles. And some of them are pastoral epistles, which was from pastor to pastor, you know, Paul to a young pastor. Um, but then many of them or the rest of them are to the churches or to surrounding churches and they were to be passed around and all that kind of stuff. So he wrote 13 out of the 21 epistles and uh, Romans. He specifically wrote while he was in Corinth back in Acts 20, where we ha he had just spent three years in Ephesus and he had been faithfully preaching for those three years. And then that's when you saw the uproar take place over the prince, um, not the princess Diana, but the goddess Diana that they worshiped. And so you saw after faithful preaching, you they finally saw things take place and the economy was being affected and all that kind of stuff from his faithful preaching. And so when he left from there because of the uproar, that's when he wrote this book. Now, he didn't end up in Rome right after he wrote this letter. It was actually another three years, okay? He didn't end up in Rome until three years later. And some of this will be important to really think about. This isn't just information. Um, you know, as we grow in the Lord and as we grow in our understanding of the scriptures, and as we grow in knowledge, it should not just be a bunch of head knowledge, but these things can play a part in our personal walk with the Lord when we think about a desire to go somewhere or to do something. And Paul, as we read today, he desired to go to them, but then we get to see of when he actually made it there. Okay. So we'll talk about that in a little more detail in a bit, but just so you guys know, um, it had been 25 years when the letter was written in Acts 20, it had been 25 years since the day of Pentecost. So I think that as we journey through the book of Acts, you know, we go chapter to chapter and sometimes we don't realize that just chapter 18 alone was a span of three years or that, you know, once we get to chapter 20, it had been about 25 years. And then when Paul actually makes it to Rome, it had been 28 years. So like when he's writing this, the day of Pentecost had taken place 25 years ago. He got saved a little bit after Pentecost. So this is, this is Paul having time now under his belt, okay? This is him having some long, longevity in his walk with Jesus, and he'd been through a lot already when the letter was written. Um, so you guys will learn as you go through it who carried the letter. She was a woman named Phoebe. You'll learn all of that kind of interesting stuff. Um, but one thing that you guys should also know it, that I think is important is that all of Paul's writings, all of his letters, they came out of his missionary work. Okay. So when he would go on these missionary journeys that you can follow, then his letters came out of that work and they were about the needs of each individual church or even the problems. Some of them are corrective letters. They were even just about the problems that were going on in the church or in the surrounding cities. Okay. So, um, okay, let's begin in verse one here. It says, this letter is from Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, chosen by God to be an apostle and sent out to preach his good news. God promised this good news long ago through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. The good news is about his son. In his earthly life, he was born into King David's family line. And he was shown to be the son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through Christ, God has given us the privilege and authority as apostles to tell Gentiles everywhere what God has done for them so that they will believe and obey him, bringing glory to his name. Okay, we're going to pause right there. 
And we're going to talk about the calling on Paul's life. And he begins his letter by stating who he is. And he says, a slave of Christ. Or maybe your, your version said a bond slave or a bond servant of Christ. That word is doulos. If it had been feminine, then it would have been doula. Okay. But like this. And so Paul says, I'm a bond slave. And so in the Old Testament, we have detailed instructions of the law and how long you were to keep a slave and slavery was a part of life. And so if you were either in major debt or you became a slave somehow, there were still laws written by God for that person. And so you would serve as a slave for six years. And then there was this thing called the year of Jubilee, the seventh year where you would be set free. Okay. And so if you had served your six years as a slave, and if your master had been good to you and was a blessing, and sometimes even, you know, sometimes masters would even get their slaves wives and they would have children and, um, you know, all of this kind of stuff in, in this culture. So you could choose to be what they call a bond servant or a bond slave where you would say, I don't want to leave your house. Like the, the year of Jubilee is great. Like I can go free now, but I don't want to. I want to stay under your roof. I want to stay serving you because you've been good to me. And so what they would do is they would take a golden awl and they would pierce the ear of that slave. And that was a symbol. That was a sign of belonging to their master. This is a really cool thing. So that is what Paul is saying when he's saying, I'm a bond servant of Christ. He is a slave by choice. So, okay. So like he chose to serve Jesus, but guys, when you think about Paul's life in Christ, when you think about, um, Acts chapter nine, okay. And what we just came through, um, you know, God said, this is what God said about Paul in Acts chapter nine, verse 15. He said, he was speaking to this other guy that was going to help, um, heal Paul's blindness. And he said, he is a chosen vessel of mine. And he said other stuff, like I've chosen him and I've shown him what he's going to suffer for me. Okay. So God had said, he's a chosen vessel of mine. In Acts chapter nine, when Paul, when Jesus revealed himself to Paul, Paul makes himself an immediate slave. Okay. So like Paul's response was, who are you? What do you want me to do? Okay. We've been talking about that a ton. Um, so just sort of realize though, that he made himself an, an immediate slave. And here we are again, like, I just want you guys to realize that. And then remembering the length of time here, when this letter's written, okay, 25 years later, Paul was still a servant of God. He was still a bond servant of God. He was still serving the Lord as he did that day on the road to Damascus. And not every day looked the same. Okay. But, and even the promise of God that he's a chosen vessel of mine and I've shown him what he's going to do. You know, when God, um, when Paul was converted to Christianity, Okay, here it, here's the deal. Acts 9 to Acts 13. Acts 13 is Paul's first missionary journey. There was nine to 10 years in between those chapters. So his conversion to Acts 13 with his first missionary journey, nine to 10 years went by in between that. And so, you know, we know that Paul went and he got saved and he went and spent three years in Arabia. We know that he went to Jerusalem to visit Peter. We know that he ministered in Antioch for a little bit. But once Barnabas went to get him and he really started his calling and his ministry, and he was doing things before that, but there was that span of time. So Paul, he made himself an immediate slave. And 25 years later, he was still saying, I'm a slave of Christ. I'm a bond sermon of Christ. And he continued. And that was really sweet. It was really sweet. You know, we don't, the girls here at Blessed Hope, we don't stream in on Wednesdays because we have class with our pastors from nine till noon every single Wednesday. And they're like never canceled because we have people on standby with videos like Will Cass. And we have all these people that, you know, step in. And so, but we've had some teen camps going on. So we got to stream in and, and I was thinking, I think we're going to stream in because usually I would just fill in. And it was such a blessing to hear Peg on year 29. Right. And I was just then, you know, waking up and doing this and 
you know, thinking all of this, it's like, he's now been walking for a long time and he's still saying the same thing, like that Christ is the answer and that Christ is fulfilling and that there's power in the Lord. And so this is just, it was a really cool thing for me to think about. So he's chosen by God to be an apostle. He made himself this immediate slave. Um, and he's also chosen by God. So a slave, but also an apostle, which an apostle just means a sent one, like a missionary. Okay. That's what an apostle means is a sent one. And there were other apostles and there are pastors and there are teachers and there are evangelists. There are people who are given to the church for the equipping of the saints. Um, but Paul is saying who he is and introducing himself in this letter. And it's really cool, you know, because he's saying, I've been chosen by God to be sent out and to preach his good news. And then in verse five, you know, he mentions that it is through Christ that he's been given this privilege and authority as apostles to tell Gentiles everywhere what God has done for them so that they will believe. So that's cool about Paul, but like, what about you guys? Well, if we move on and go to six, it says, and you are included among these Gentiles who have been called to belong to Jesus Christ. I am writing to all of you in Rome who are loved by God and are called to be his own holy people. So I just thought about the calling of God on our lives. And, you know, um, Paul writes about his own calling. He says that, uh, you know, he gets to tell Gentiles everywhere what God has done for them. But he says, you are included. I just wrote down, like, out of verses 6 and 7, if you really dig into those, um, because I don't know about you guys, but when I was brand new at learning about the Lord, like, I didn't have anything. have anything I did have wasn't good, you know? And so I didn't really have an identity. I didn't even know who I was. And then when you took away my drugs, because I was trying to not do them, there was like a hole. It felt empty because that's how I had identified like myself. I just, my life was wrapped up in all of this crap. Right. And so I just remember thinking like, who am I even like, what am, what is my, what am I going to do? And I was meeting with the Lord. If you want to go. <laughs> Sorry, my um, you guys can see the little feet in the background. Those are my kids coming out of my office. So I've got a girl on it though. Okay, so um, just one minute. Okay. Sorry about that, Peg. I just wanted to make sure that they weren't giving her a hard time. Um, so just not even know, I remember just being like, who am I? Like, what am I doing? And um, Peg, pause for just a second. Kristen, can you pause the recording? Oh, no, oh, she's back. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm back. I just told her to go get the popsicles at the church, so they should be outside now. Okay. Um, so let's get back to this. Um, okay, so when I was brand new, I just remember thinking, like, I don't even know who I am apart from these things. I had such insecurity. I was so insecure. Friendships were hard to make. I was, you know, with all these other girls. And I didn't really know how to even have girl friendships. And then it was annoying too sometimes. And so there was just so much insecurity I remember having. And then even like a sadness because all of like the, the things that I would turn to for comfort or for like a boldness, those things are gone, right? I'm no longer turning to drugs. I'm not turning to a drink to come out of my shell a little bit and to have some confidence. And it was like this stripping away. And there was this season of just not really knowing even who I was. So 
in verses six and seven, there are some really sweet things that I want you guys to pull out of. Paul says, first of all, like after, cause he's confident, like Paul is confident in who he was. This is who I am. Like I am, I am the Lord's. He would always say that the Lord's to whom I belong and to whom I serve. Right. And he would say, I'm an apostle. I'm a sent one. I'm a slave. So he would right here and you are included. And I just wrote down like personal, like who am I? Like I am included. And the next one was, um, who have been called to belong to Jesus. I am called, seriously, my devotions this morning. I am included. I am called to belong. The, the other one in seven, I am loved by God. I'm writing to all of you in Rome, he says, who are loved by God. This is a letter that was inspired by the Holy Spirit for you guys to read. So this is for you. I am um, loved by God. And it says, I'm called to be his own. And those are the four things I wrote down. I'm included. I'm called to belong. I'm loved by God. And I'm called to be his own. These are the things that are like the foundation of my life. And if I were to just take inventory of like who I am today, because I'll tell you guys like who God's made me today <laughs> is like, you know, I'm Adam's wife. I'm a farmer's wife. I have to introduce myself when we meet with the main state department of agriculture. I'm Adam's wife. I'm the owner of Sundance farm. You know, I am here at the church. I'm one of the elders wives and there's those things that we participate in here. Okay. Um, in school life, people might not know who I am at Penobscot Christian school until I say, Oh, I'm Jackson's mom. <laughs> I'm Jackson's mom or I'm Cozy's mom or Oslo's or Otis or Ollie, whatever when I missed. Okay, that's who I am. Like I'm this person's mom. And then it's like, oh, okay, we know you. We know we love Oslo or whatever. I'm the director of the Blessed Hope Women's Program. Okay, and so if whoever I'm calling, I'm calling a probation officer, or if I'm calling a lawyer, if I'm calling the chief down at the jail in Florida, it's like, hey there, I'm Emily. I'm the director of Blessed Hope Women's Program, blah, blah, blah. You know, and so it's like all of these things, but I'll tell you that like that doesn't make up the foundation of who I am. Like at the start of it, I'm Christ. Because those are just the things that God has made me. So as Paul writes and he's like, this is, you know, this is who I am. God sent me. I get the honor. I get the privilege of telling people about the good news about the gospel. And guess what? You're included. And I wanted to do the same thing. Like it's been a blessing, like just to sit back and see where I started and to see what the Lord's done in my life is like extremely humbling. And to know that he has the same sort of plans for you guys in the sense of good plans. Okay. And so I just, you know, was thinking about this and um, thinking about, um, hold on. Oh yeah. Our calling. So God says like, at, like there you're included in this. And uh, let's read some verses. Let's read Matthew 4, 19 and 20. Did I give that to you, Catherine? Oh, we got it. Mm -hmm. um, Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Yeah, so the beginning of the calling for these men, for Peter... For John, for James, it says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And that once they get up and left their nets. And so there is a call of God. The scriptures also say, okay, I didn't give you guys this verse, but in Matthew 22, 14, the scriptures say many are called and few are chosen. Like God calls many, but few respond is what it is. Like you are chosen. You know, you're chosen if you respond to the invitation. And so um, the call is to follow the Lord and he, he will make you into what his plan for your life. God has good plans for you. Let's read about that. Ephesians 2.10. Um, Ephesians 2.10. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us, cre created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. 
Okay, I love that one where God's masterpiece. You might not feel like a masterpiece. You might feel like a hot mess. You probably are at some point in the beginning, especially, you know, or the the word also says you are God's poem, the poema, the uh, masterpiece. You're his work in progress. And it says that you've been created in Christ Jesus for good works, that you should walk in them. So like legit, God has a plan. And he doesn't always reveal it all at once. Let's go back and talk about Paul. Paul, at Paul's conversion, in those three days of blindness, I don't know exactly when, we have the record of Jesus revealing himself to Paul and, you know, the whole, why are you kicking against the goads and all that. Um, and then Paul's, you know, his becoming this immediate slave. Excuse me. And then we have um, Paul's, uh, we have the Lord's in 915, in Acts 915, when the Lord said, hey, I've chosen him and I've shown him what he's going to suffer. So that was within those first few days of his conversion that God showed Paul what he was going to suffer for his name. Now, Paul was committed and that whole immediate slave deal, he was ready okay, to take that on. God doesn't always work like that. He might. Okay. God is cool, um, but he knows what each one of us needs. And so um, he had, what we do know is that he has plans for our lives. He doesn't always say, follow me and I'm going to make you a missionary in Africa and you're going to, and you just like have the whole plan. And I don't know that we would love that if he did. Um, I remember Peggy used to say, if God had shown her the whole plan, she might not have wanted to commit. And I, I can, you know, I am on that same sort of track. Like if God had told me on day one that I would have five kids and be the director of a program and all this stuff, I don't really know. Like I didn't desire that at first. I didn't become this automatic slave. Like when I was brand new, the word of God was meeting me in my depression and God's, the truth was, you know, my heart was being revived and I was like, this is the truth and okay, like Jesus is real. And I already you know, knew that my whole life, but the Lord's presence was around and there, I was just learning about him. But there came a time about two months in where the Lord said, okay, now are you going to follow me? Like you got saved, you know, I got saved and was learning how to walk. And then I came to a crossroads where I was like, okay, are you going to follow me? Are you going to lay things down? Just like the Matthew 4, 19 which says, follow me and I'll make you, you know, whatever he's going to make you. But then they got up and they left their nets right away. And that there is a cost to discipleship. Paul left things behind. He counted things as dung and he also count. It was something that he continually did. And we see that with his time frame here. And we know that he would continue, he did that for his whole life. And so, you know, for me, it was a relationship. Like when I came into Blessed Hope, I did not think I was gonna get sober. I just needed to get back in control of my addiction. And then I met Jesus and that was filling my heart and soul like no drug could. And then you walk. And then I came to that crossroads and that crossroads was, okay, are you gonna follow me? And what following me looks like is letting go of that relationship that you love so much. And that was really hard. And, and it was, it would take forever. And I think I just shared this with my ladies the other day where I wanted to make the right decision. And, but my heart and my emotions was the biggest battle and I knew the right thing to do, but then everything would be complicated and I would just have to simply obey. And as I would obey the Lord, then he would come in and give me everything I needed to actually follow through. It would just be this little choice. I would have to say, okay, God, I'm going to do this. And I would step out and the Lord would show up and give me the strength and the ability. Right. And he gave me people like Peg to actually help me follow through with like writing a letter and saying goodbye. Okay. So, um, but God has good plans and the Lord didn't say, um, Leave this relationship that you love so much behind because I have a good godly man for you that's going to, you know, like bless you with your heart's desires and desires that I you forgot about from your childhood 
that I didn't forget about. Like God didn't make that kind of promise to me. God just simply said, like, leave him behind. And that was it. There was no promise for a husband. There was no promise for a farm. And, you know, there's promises that haven't come to pass yet that I know are right around the corner. And like, but God didn't tell me any of that. He just said, leave this behind. And I am now 19 years later saying I have never regretted any decision to leave anything behind. I would have major regrets if I didn't listen to the Lord and if I had given into my heart and if I had given into my feelings and if I had followed that, then I wouldn't be where I am today. And so God was faithful and God had plans and I just had to walk in them obediently and he changed my heart. So, okay. So we've read about follow me, um, you know, where God's workmanship, there's good works that God has for each of you guys that you should walk in them. Jeremiah 29, 11. Jeremiah 29, 11, it says, for I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord plans for welfare and not for evil to give you a future and a hope. Okay. I know we quote that one a lot. Don't let your heart and your ears grow dull to it. It says, I know the plans I have for you, or I know the thoughts I think towards you. God thinks things towards you. And he says, I know what they are. And he says, and what they include is things for good, peace. They include peace and a future. I love that. I've got plans for good and for a future for you. Her version said welfare. You know, I've got like good dealings towards you. That's a promise from the Lord that he has plans. I like plans. Like I like planning things. I like planning things for my kids. It's fun. You, I have all these secrets that I just want to bless them with. I don't tell them about any of it because they would be nonstop nagging me. When, 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 when? Okay. So I get it. Like as a mom, I'm like, Lord, you, you know, you know, not to say things. And so you know, we just have to trust, believe. So we're, when we're at the beginning, we have the truth of God's word that rings true, where we read a verse like that and we know God has good plans for me. Then we have people older than us in the Lord that are testifying. God has good plans for you. Just like he did for me, he'll do for you. Okay. Then he has our past mess ups to also sort of motivate us. Like we don't want to, all I know is I don't want to do that again. <laughs> you know? And, but when you're in the beginning, I'll tell you, you guys just keep on going. And, um, it's so exciting. It's my favorite part of this job is getting to see what the Lord does with people. Joshua 24, 14 through 15. Now, therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers, sorry, my screen is jumping around, the gods of the, the gods of your fathers served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in those land whose land you dwell but as for me and my house we will serve the lord this is joshua towards the end of his time as a leader and you know he was saying listen like you're either going to serve the gods on the other side of the flood um in egypt or you're going to serve the lord serve the lord in sincerity and truth he says serve him and he's like, if, you know, choose, he says, choose who you're going to serve. And it is a choice. You do not have to be bound by desire. You were bound by desire when you were a slave to sin, which Romans will do a thorough job of explaining our flesh and being a slave to sin, as well as that's in Romans six, chapter seven, and the spirit filled life and walking in step with the Holy Spirit and where the freedom from your desires exists. And so you don't have to be a slave to sin. You can choose who you are going to serve and the feelings will follow later. 
and the desire will change and you will desire to follow the Lord. Um, but it does begin oftentimes with just the choice to do what is right and being done with um, all of the consequences that you've had to reap and all of that. So, um, so the calling is for you guys as well. God saying, Hey, come on, just be my own. Um, you're loved. I love you. And this is really like, I can't say it enough. Like people will ask me all the time, like, how do you do it all? Like, how do you manage the farm and the program and the kids and the school and the, you know, volunteering to do a bake sale? I wish I never do that. I always have to make myself a note, never volunteer to bake anything for school. Um, and the answer is that I got up and did my devotions today. <laughs> like legit. Like that's just <laughs> it. Like I would fall apart just thinking about all the roles. And the roles are like, you know, it's not just like, oh, right now I'm a director. And right now I'm a mom, like you guys just saw, like they merge, <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's like, you just roll with the punches and you do what the Lord is calling you to do. So anyways, it's a blessing. Like, this is just so good. Like at the beginning of my day, it's just me and Jesus. Like it has to be me and Jesus because everything will just be chaotic. So I don't like, you guys have to start there too. And this thing in the programs that we have laid out for you. This is a, you know, a mold, if you will, to take on with you as you get up. And the first thing you do is sit before the Lord. And that's what you, you know, it's, it's designed to give you good habits. Okay. So we're going to move on a little bit, but I do just want to drive home something about Paul's conversion in Acts 9 and his first missionary trip in Acts 13. And just that space between those nine to 10 years, like God was at work in Paul's life. It wasn't like he so he made, he told Paul, this is my plan for you, Paul. Um, you're going to suffer for my name's sake, but you're my chosen one to go to the Gentiles. And when God makes a promise, it doesn't always happen right away. And it could be right around the corner. Listen, in the, in the uh, gospels, when Jesus says to his disciples, not many days from now, some of you are going to see my glory. And literally six days later, three of them get to see him transfigured before them. Okay, so that's cool. I was like, Lord, when you make a promise, can it just be six days later? Because that would be so awesome. Um, but listen, you little immediate gratification seekers, like <laughs> God, is, he's into you to chill and he's into you learning to wait mm -hmm. and patience and all of this. Um, so there is a time of waiting for promises to be fulfilled. And in that time, you can either wait and trust and grow closer to the Lord and enjoy things. Or you can step out to try to make some of that promise come through to fruition and it, you will not be happy. You will be, you will hate it. Um, we have examples in the old Testament. You know, Abraham is one of our greatest examples of, Hey, you're going to be a father of many nations. And then, you know, the total years was 75 years, FYI the total amount of years for his waiting for his promise. And it was like, I mean, I forget because I didn't go look, but, you know, maybe 10 years into it or something like that. Don't quote me on that. But anyways, he waited for a time and then he stepped out and listened to his wife who was probably just insecure and, you know, all of that. And then he slept with Hagar and Ishmael was his actual firstborn son that God doesn't recognize and Isaac was his firstborn son of Sarah, which is where the nation of Israel comes from. And Ishmael also had 12 kids, 12 patriarchs, and they're wild men and men of war. And that is actually where all of the fighting over there in Israel and it's my land and all this crap comes from. All of that comes from Abraham's choice to not wait on the Lord. And so if that's not a picture of what our flesh and operating in our flesh can do and how it can impact, like then, I mean, that's the greatest picture of how operating in our flesh um, has, it just can continue to um, affect the world. So, but just like that, your obedience can affect those around you in a huge way. That's like really cool. So there's like a time of waiting, grow time. That's what I like to call it. There's grow time. And it's like, here's the promise. 
And then we don't exactly know when it will be brought through to fruition, but there is time to grow. And while you're waiting, you know, in like first Peter or second Peter, it says, listen, add this to your faith, add this, add patience, add brotherly kindness. And it keeps on going and there's growing that takes place. And so just like when a seed gets planted in the soil, before you actually see something pop up, there's germination that is taking place, but germination takes place underground, undercover. And but it has to take place before you actually start to see the fruit. So, um, so I really just want to drive that home for you guys, because when we, you know, we think, okay, Paul just like God knocked him down and he got saved and then, okay. Yeah. Like we have testimony. He went away here. We went away there, but in the book of acts, as we go chapter to chapter, we just see like there was actual years that would be in between some of these chapters and so nine to 10 years, I was Peggy's assistant here for nine years um, before she left. And, you know, in those nine years, it was blessed. Like I just got to learn and watch. And I had, I was newly married and then also becoming a mom. So there was a lot of like personal, just like trying to figure stuff out and, you know, and, but I would just come to work each day and then just learn. And God was doing things in my heart during that time. And I still didn't realize that he would call me to be the director. In fact, when she told me she was praying about leaving, I was pregnant with my second child and I was also praying about leaving. And I remember having this one conversation with her in the office where she, we were just joking and she was like, wouldn't that be funny if we both left at the same time? And then literally the next day, the Lord spoke to me in the in devotions and it was Paul writing to Timothy and he said, remain in Ephesus and teach no other doctrine. And Paul loved Ephesus. Paul spent three years in Ephesus. He does. I told you guys that he spent, um, he wrote this letter from Corinth when he was just there for three months, but there's another time he's there for a year and a half. And so as Paul would just go around his missionary journeys, like he would spend time in these churches and and so that's why he knew them so well and he was able to write to them. So for this church, he hadn't yet been there, but this church's existence dates back to the day of Pentecost because Jews came into Jerusalem um, for that feast and they got saved. And so there's believers there and he can't wait to get to them. He just wants to get to them so that he can impart a blessing to them so that he can, you know, work among them and, and help them grow. So, um, okay. I don't know where I've read to probably. Okay. Let's read verse eight. Um, let me say first that I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith in him is being talked about all over the world. God knows how often I pray for you day and night. I bring you and your needs in prayer to God whom I serve with all my heart by spreading the good news about his son. One of the things I pray for, I always pray for, is the opportunity, God willing, to come and at last to see you. So verse 10, he's praying for the opportunity. Remember in Acts when God stood beside him and said, hey, you're gonna, you're gonna actually be able to testify about me in Rome. God hadn't told him that yet as he's writing this. Um, I just think this stuff is cool when you get to, when you start to learn like, hey, this was written you know, in Acts 20, well, God hadn't promised him that yet, you know, so he hadn't told Paul that he would be his witness. So it's cool because in Acts 20, so just a few chapters later, God answers his prayer that he was, that we get to read. He's praying right now. You know, I'm praying for the opportunity and God hadn't yet told him that he would be there. Um, so this is one of the things he would always pray for is he would pray for opportunity and praying for opportunity as a is a great thing and um, to be able to share your faith. So in 11, it says, for I long to visit you so I can bring some spiritual gift so that will help you grow strong in the Lord. When we get together, I want to encourage you in your faith, but I also want to be encouraged by yours. 13, I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to visit you, but I was prevented until now. I want to work among you and see spiritual fruit, just as I have seen among other Gentiles. For I have a great sense of obligation to people in both the civilized world and the rest of the world, to the educated and the uneducated alike. So I am eager to come to you in Rome, too, to preach the good news. 
So he wanted them to know that he had planned many times. Paul had at various times made plans to get to Rome. And we know like that sometimes the Lord, even when he was trying to get to Ephesus at one point, the Holy Spirit forbade him and he ended up going up into like Macedonia. So like he had made plans, but he was prevented. And even still, I'm just going to keep saying it, it still ends up being three years before he makes it after writing this letter. So just, you know, planning, making, these are good plans. Paul wasn't planning to go get drunk. <laughs> like he wasn't making bad plans. He's planning to get to a place because he wants to bring the gospel. And yet even that is subject to God's timing. And with our plans, it is not bad to make plans. Um, you know, we have a little one, Riley, who's like 19 or 20 here. And like one of the biggest things for her laying down her life to come here and seek the Lord was like the plans because you're she were graduating high school. And that's like this time. Actually, we have two. We have a 17 year old, too, who's really taking a step like when you're a sort of good, you know, Christian kid, like church kid. Um, that's the time where your friends, you're excited, you know, you're out of school and there's plans. And to watch these two girls come and put themselves in a program and decide to follow the Lord. And I remember just seeing like the battle of, okay, well, what about my car? Like, am I even going to be able to have that car again? And, you know, all those sorts of things. And to, to hear her testify the other day about just laying that down, not worrying. And then how the Lord really in a shorter time, you know, six, seven months later, being able to actually open up the door to make some of those plans. Here's some cool things about our planning though. Proverbs 16, 9. Um, a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord determines his steps. A man's heart plans his way, oops, but the Lord determines his steps. So um, making plans, but keeping them surrendered to Jesus and to his will and to his time. Proverbs 15, 22. Plans fail or for lack of counsel but with many advisors, they succeed. That one says, um, basically get counsel while planning. <laughs> okay. That's my version. Many plans may fail for lack of counsel. Okay. So just while you're making plans, especially when you are new at, in the Lord, you should have counsel being involved. Proverbs 19, 21. Okay. Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Awesome. God's got the plan and his plan stands. Psalm 143 verse 8. Let me hear in the morning of your steadfast love, for I trust in you. Make me know the way I should go, for to you I lift up my soul. Okay, where should I go, Lord? What should I do? That verse has caused me to hear in the morning. Let me hear of your loving kindness in the morning. And so if you um, are like, I don't know what to do, or I want to do this, or I'm making plans, but you're not in the word daily, I don't know how you expect to hear from the Lord. But I do know that if you're in the word then God will direct your life and you can bring your plans to him. You know, I can every single day bring my life to Jesus and just say, okay, here's what's invading my mind today. Here's how I don't know how this is going to work today. There's an appointment. There's an endless yard sale we're participating in. There's this, there's that, you know, how is this all going to work out? And the Lord will talk to me about, the simple things like that. Okay. So I know that might seem simple to you, but when you have management over a lot of stuff, it's a big deal. I need to be told what to do in each thing. Okay. So um, let's go on. 
He says in verse 16, for I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes um, the Jew first and also the Gentile. This good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. It says, as the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. This is like one of the landmark scriptures. I'm not ashamed of the gospel and I'm not ashamed of the good news. So lives are transformed by the good news of Jesus. Lives are transformed, not medicated and made to behave, right? Not modifying your behavior where you're just <clears throat> like a dry drunk is the term, right? Where you're, you still, your life is still seems the same, just minus the drug or whatever. The gospel transforms hearts and minds, makes you a new creation. And Paul was not ashamed of this good news. It is the power of God at work. The gospel is the power of, of God at work in people's lives. God is at work. God is saving people and changing people. And, you know, I kind of skimmed over verses two and three, but I wanted to, um, you know, read 16 and 17 coupled with two and three, because at the start, he said, God promised this good news long ago through the Holy prophets. When anybody know, when did God, um, make that promise for the good news? Like when was the first promise? Genesis three. Good job. Yeah. The, the, um, Promise was made in Genesis chapter three, when God was talking to Adam and Eve and said, your seed, you know, to the woman, because a woman doesn't have seed. Okay. But we'll crush the serpent's head. And that was the first uh, promise, prophetic promise about the coming Messiah. So that's Genesis chapter three. That's like way at the start of creation. So this is a promise. You know, we've talked about promises. We talked about plans. And how God has a call in our life. God had a call in Paul's life. We've learned the time period where he actually started walking in that call. And then we read today about how the gospel is the power of Christ to transform the good news of Jesus. It is the, is the um, power that transforms lives. And then we read, God promised this good news long ago in verse two through the prophets. And that is how long ago he promised that. Okay. That is a very long time ago. And just so you know, the earth has been around for 6,000 years. Right. So I know sometimes people have learned some really wacky wonky things in the government schools. Um, but the, we have a young earth. Oh, fun fact. Um, the earth is only five days older than us. <laughs> like we were created on day six, you know, and then days one through five, the earth and everything else was made. Okay. So, you know, we do have, we have a young earth. And so this is the promise that came in. The good news is about his son. And then it says his earthly life, he was born into King David's family line. So he came, the promise was fulfilled. Um, in, and that was 4,000 years later from the beginning of creation. It was 4,000. That was a long time to fulfill a promise, speaking on our terms, okay? Um, so it says that in his earthly life, he was born into King David's family line, and he was shown to be the son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is the only Savior the only God of all these different religions that are out there that they're, that the followers that we have and um, you know, where he was resurrected, like other gods remain dead and there's no claim to even a resurrection, but Jesus has been resurrected and that sets Christianity apart from others. That's like the main thing that sets Christianity apart from all these other religions is that Jesus Christ rose from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is Christ Jesus, our Lord. Okay, so I just want to close with one interesting thing because um, God made that promise in Genesis. And then it was 4,000 years later that that promise came through to fruition 
in the incarnation of Jesus Christ on earth, okay? And we are now waiting for a promise, right? Like we are waiting for Christ's return. Um, I'm into timelines. I pulled out my revelation. I make my own timelines. I don't know. Like I think they're pretty accurate. Um, this one I know is because a lot of it came from my pastor and then I just added my stuff to it. But God instituted the week. Like, where did we get a seven-day work week from? It came from the Lord, okay? When he started creation on day one, day two, day three, day three, day four, on, he has things that he made on each day. On the sixth day, he made man, and then on the seventh day, he rested. Then as you go through the Old Testament, you'll read, I just, I actually mentioned earlier about six years of slavery, six years this, six years that, and then there was the seventh year of Jubilee, which was when people would go free. And so you can see that God instituted a seven-day period, right? And so a seven-day, that's why we have a seven-day work week. So in the span of time then from creation to where we are presently, um, oh, there's a verse. I don't think I, oh, I did give it to you. Okay, so 2 Peter 3, just read verse 4 first. I'll just keep going. He will say, where is this coming? He promised. Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. So I don't know if you guys could hear her or not, but she said, where will they, where is he? They say, ever since the beginning of time, everything's just been going on. Okay. Where is the promise of his coming? That's what second Peter chapter three, verse four records. Peter is quoting them. This is what you say. You say, where is his coming? And then read 8 through 10. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Okay, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. So knowing... The word of God says a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. I have this timeline of a week, Sunday, the beginning of time. It says creation between, it's a one day, a thousand years goes by. Okay. And from Adam to Abraham is 20 generations. You, this is all just straight from the genealogical, genealogical, whatever. The record of whose dad is whose dad and whose kid and all that, okay? You can actually go count. So there's 20 generations. Now, Methuselah lived like 960 something years. So like it was like long generations. So there's 20 generations from Adam to Abraham or 2,000 years. So creation, 1,000, 2,000 right here. Tuesday would be the second day of the week or the third, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. So 2,000 years in, we've got this little thing here. This says when the flood was, and you can know that, like there's, you can figure this all stuff out. Noah was 600 years old is what the scriptures say when the flood happened. So you can figure out in time. Wednesday was 3,000 years later. So 1,000 years, 2,000 years, 3,000 years, 4,000 years was a Thursday. Like I'm just saying on a timeline of a week, Jesus came in 4,000 years when the earth was 4,000 years old. And he entered creation, the incarnation of Jesus. And in Joel 2, 28 through 30, as well as Acts 2, 17, the scriptures say, in the last days, God said, I'm going to pour out my spirit. Well, Thursday is the last days of the week. And now Jesus, like it's been 2,000 years, right, you guys? It's been 2,000 years since Jesus was here. So where does that put us? That puts us at the end of the week. If Jesus 4,000 years later came in, then we are towards the end of the year, the end of the week. Does this excite you guys? I'm like into this kind of stuff. So I'm like, do you guys get it? Like a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years to the Lord. Like we are close. All right. We are close to that day of rest. That Saturday, Hebrews 4 says, be diligent to enter into that rest. These are just some of my notes. In Jude, it says that Enoch was the seventh 
generation from Adam. So like you, you know, if you're a student of the word, you can go and look at that stuff. So like my point in all of that is that because Paul said he made a promise and that promise was fulfilled when Jesus came. Well, ladies, there's been another promise and it's the promise of his return. And it really is not far away. And so to, you know, it's just like this urgency. I'm always, I have to touch on that stuff. Like the Lord has given me um, a conviction, not like every single time, but on most opportunities that I have, it, it's within the word. Like I'm not forcing it. Like that was where I went today was this promise that was fulfilled and it took 4,000 years. And like, there's still this other promise we're waiting for. It's just in my heart and in my mind, the, the return of Christ. And I have a, a little conviction to share about it each time I teach. Not to produce fear or anything like that, but, well, a motivating fear. It's just, you know, God is good and we should serve him and he has good plans and he's coming back. And there's a whole bunch of plans in heaven, too, that are going to be amazing. So, yay, there it is. Okay, the only thing I want to say, I'm pretty sick and look really yucky so i'm not turning on my video because it's bad um but i just love this teaching that god gave you um i love the really um i hope that you know the ladies at renew listened and really heard i hope all of you did because it really is true um having done so much to try to get sober and change my life it's the gospel it's meeting jesus that transformed me it's his word and it's his word that has been transforming all of us. He's the one with that power. And the enemy will lie to you and tell you that he doesn't have, that you, you know, he still has power, but it's believing the truth of what God says and choosing to obey him in those tiny moments. And I really love that she went there and talked about the moments where between her and the Lord, she just had that wrestle because we, we know that there's a wrestle in our souls. And, you know, I wrote this too, and you, and, and I put my name in there are included among those. I put each of your names in there and then he's called each one of you from renew from blessed hope, you know, to, he knows you. And I just really like thought that through and was praying that through. And I just hope I really hope that you heard the intimate moments because I, I know some of the ladies that renew, I know that you are really trying to wrestle down some things that you want to walk with Christ. You, you know that um, he's calling you to lay some things down. He's calling you to step away from some things. And I really love that she, uh, that she um, told you that when he called her to lay down that relationship, that he called her to do that without a promise. It wasn't like, do this and I'll give you more. It was just do this because I'm asking me you to. And that is where faith grows. Like now she looks back and goes, gosh, Lord, you had all this plan for me. And it just took simple steps of obedience. And I love what she said, because it's true for me too. I don't regret one thing I have surrendered to the Lord, not one. Um, you know, at, at sometimes it was hard. Um, mo lots of times it was hard. Um, and she's right. I, I don't know that I would have, I don't know what I would have done, but if he told me it would be, you know, 13 years before a husband and that I would move from San Diego to Maine, like, I don't know how I would have felt about all that, but he didn't um, because he loves me. He's just asking for you to surrender and obey today. And in that step of surrender, comes the grace and the strength to do it and then it builds your faith so i love that i love this teaching em. um do you i think anybody have anything they 